Dr. Terry, and I want to thank all the rest of you very, very much for being here today as we're here to celebrate Anne Bray. If you knew her very well, you knew that she was a true crime buff, all right? That's what she enjoyed reading, that's what she enjoyed listening to on podcasts, it's what she also enjoyed watching when occasionally she would watch TV. Well, we'll probably not solve all the mysteries of living and dying today, but as we remember on Anne's past, I hope she will provide for all of us an opportunity to solve the mystery regarding our future. I love a comment, the oral piece that was on this table right here just a few months ago, and it went like this, because someone we love is in heaven, there's a little bit of heaven in our hearts. And I think that is most definitely true about Anne Bray. You see, I'm very glad today that death doesn't have the last word, and that the grave is not our final destination. If that was true, I would be here today, because this would be the most miserable place on earth. Rather, today, in spite of Disneyland not being open in California, this is the happiest place. And the reason it is, is because we know that Anne is in the best place that God has ever created. It is a place called heaven. There is a hope in someone that is so real that in a few weeks we're going to celebrate his birth. The only reason we celebrate his birth is because there is a resurrection for the one who was born because death could not hold him. You see, it is he, Jesus Christ, not religion, not works or effort, that makes heaven attainable and available for us all. So I'm glad you've come today. I'm glad each of you have come. For those of you who are family, we're here together because family needs each other on days like today. You share common memories and common love and common experiences, and uh, this time together today will help bring closure for you. I'm glad those of you who are friends to them because you make a difference to the family members, knowing that somebody that they love so much was also loved by others. So thank you for being here. I'm a pastor at your church. And I have a bias, and that is I'm glad God is here. He shows up at every one of these services, whether they're inside a church building, whether they're outdoors in a park, whether they're at a, a cemetery, or whether they're in somebody's backyard. God shows up every single time. He never intrudes, he never forces his never demands your attention, but he's always present. And the reason he's present is he made a promise thousands of years ago. He said, I am the God of all comfort. Please notice he didn't say, I am the God that says there's trouble. Straight forward in the scriptures. In this world, you will have trouble. In this world, we will sorrow and grieve, but there's a not as those who have no hope. That's the difference maker for you today, Terry. Is what happened last week was not the final say. It wasn't the last. Heaven is. That is the promise of God. So in your loss, find the to knowing that there is more to come and it's better than in the past. I know that uh, Anne had a lot of likes in her life. She liked rocks. They're evidenced by the beautifully painted on the table up here. She loved doing hard work and there's a uh, she loved her investigative opportunities and that's kind of indicated by the certificate of becoming a paralegal though she really never practiced as a paralegal but she knew the law so she checked you out legally. <laughs> Find out all there was to know about anybody that she was put on their trail. Well, what I believe is important on days like today is what is our perspective, what is our perspective of living, what is our perspective of, perspective of what's on the other side of death. And I can't make you believe anything about what's on the other side. If you're here today and you believe all there is, I'm so very, very sorry. Uh, and if that's your perspective, then live like hell and don't worry about it. But if you have a hope for there is something better and something more than what we experience in this life. And of course, probably the thing that is driving most folks' attention these past 24 hours and 4 to 36 hours is who's our president going to be? And both sides of the fence, that creates a lot of angst and anxiety. I'm here to tell you, it really doesn't make any difference who our next president is in terms of eternity. Because the God of peace and the God of confidence and the God of hope will be on the throne and he can still be in our lives today. And if we have a hope that there is something, then we put our trust in him. 
There was an anthropologist who was studying a primitive tribe in South, uh, South America that years earlier had been reached a missionary. After having lived among the tribe for several weeks, the anthropologist met with the tribe's leader, and he said, you have a wonderful culture here, but it's a shame that the missionary came and infected your tribe with his religion. The chief replied, see that rock? That's where we used to break the skulls. See that tree? That's where we would sacrifice them to our God. And if we had not learned of the love of Christ as Lord, you would be our dinner tonight. <laughs> Perspective is very important of how we look at circumstances. I don't know what your perspective is, and I don't know what you figured you were in for when you came here today, but what will make a difference between our spirits and our is our perspective of living and dying and eternity. And let's see if we can set some perspective remembering Anne's life. She was born 61 years ago in Port Arthur, Texas on August 1959. Family, don't mean to put you on the spot. Don't feel bad if you don't know the answer. I've only had one person who I've ever asked this question to who knew the end. Do you know what day of the week that Anne was born on? So from this moment on, she was born on Sunday, first day of the week. She didn't want to miss one moment of the week ahead of her, all right? So she was born. Uh, I can tell you also something that we don't know. We don't know who our next president is. We do know who the president was. She, she was born. That was quite. Eisenhower. She shared her birthday with probably more, but at least two pretty famous people that in this room will know. Those of you under 40 might not recognize these names, but the rest of us will. She shared her birthday with Carol O'Connor. Remember that guy? Now, he was born in a different year, but the same day, all right, 1924. He was the guy who played Archie Bunker and Chief Gillespie, all right, in the heat of the night. And then uh, also with Peter O'Toole. That British actor, all right, pretty much uh, well known for now. There were some pretty songs that came out that hit the pop the year that Anne was born. How many of you remember Bobby Darren? <laughs> Bobby Darren had the top two hits of the year number one and number two, Mac the Knife and Dream Lover. And then the Platters had a hit song that year. This would be a all remember Smoke It.
while in high school, she met a young man who was a busboy and a local diner by the name of Ted Ruiz. The same year of graduation was also the same year of matrimony. Ted and Ann were married in 77. Remember, 77 and Sunset Strip came out when he was born. And they were married for 70 years. The years were blessed with two sons, Teddy and his wife Elizabeth, from Woodland, California. Kenny and Lisa got married right here, and they now live in Van Alston, Texas. And these two boys have three grandkids, Cassidy, Brant, and Brooklyn, ranging from 8 to 18. In the mid-80s, Ann was attending a concert with some girlfriends. So it happens that a guy by the name of Terry Gray was also attending that concert. Looked across a crowded theater. Terry had the courage to go over when the concert was over and invite her to a party after the concert. And her girlfriends told her she would go, and, uh, and they did. The concert the party was turned into a wedding on January the 17th, 1987. That was over 33 years ago. Ted had two children, a daughter and a son, and they became a... a and uh, finally, uh, finally for... There was a girl, all right, to go with all those boys that were in her life. Uh, Janine Johnson and her husband Russ lived in Greg and his wife in Boise, Idaho. Janine and Rick added six more grandchildren to the quiver. Jordan, Brent, Connor, Seth, Carson, and Larry. And seven great-grandchildren. Let me see if I get all these right, all right? You guys correct me if I screw it up. Paige, Presley, Hudson, Huntley, Trevor, Ashton, Hazley. Did we get them all right? <laughs> all right. And then I understand there's one more on Do we have a name? Remy. 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 All right. Was this a disclosure for the first time? <laughs> Stockings. <laughs> and he said, wow, what's, what, where's the 
where's the ten thousand dollars come from? And she said, stockings that I sold. <laughs> Thank you 
so much. In Jesus' name. Amen. Daddy, come on over here and share your thoughts about your mom. pick ourselves up and carry on when we lose someone special to the break. No one gives you a playbook on how to deal with a parent or a loved one. From a young age, we know it is like this, but there is no way to prepare. In the next few minutes, I'd like to give you a little insight into Anne's life. Help us pick ourselves up, laugh, celebrate our lives, and continue to live as Anne would want us to live. First, our family is receiving phone calls, text messages, and support that we process through this. We appreciate the food, the cookies, and the pies. But don't be afraid to bring a veggie plate to the house. <laughs> <laughs> the amount of support from near and far, literally as far as our neighbors who live in Denmark, shows how much Ann meant to everybody, to so many people, so many lives that she has. Friends and family are the center of every story my mom told, telling stories of family and friends with the biggest smile on my face. I remember mom talking about growing up in that small house with all of her brothers and sisters, with her parents, her and her Typically, it was always a pan of mac and cheese in the fridge, and a loaf of white bread on the table. It was a time when the wanted a meatloaf, and grandma made a ten family <laughs> eight meatloaf for <laughs> that one incident made my mom never make or eat me alone. <laughs> she laughed at those stories and smiled when she told me. She fondly remembered childhood. Mom would laugh when she talked about how Tim talked about her. She was such a good student in high school that they asked her to leave after half of their class. <laughs> I always kept that in my quiver because I wasn't the best student, but I was never. <laughs> when the family talked about stories to share, uh, and things we should talk about to keep this light, this one story won an unanimous approval. That it, be. it was a time that Anne wanted to go river rafting. I was young, but I knew my mom was not.
Ricky was as big as he is now. <laughs> One morning, breakfast time came, and Ricky was hungry. Anne was asleep. He knocked on the door several times, said he wanted to eat, she wanted to get up and make breakfast. <laughs> several times, she said, okay, I'll get up in a few minutes. Lion tamer walked into the cage on tame lions. <laughs> Ricky went into my mom's room, lifted her out of bed, stood her in front of the stove and made breakfast. Sharing it would make her smile. 
value the things that my mom made for people was not monetary, but it was in the intentional investment of time that she made for someone. My mom continued to cook for us, even though she hurt simply standing in the kitchen. There was one thing she wanted us to feel, it was full. Nobody is allowed to be hungry at Anne's house, ever. She connected to phone calls, FaceTime, text messages, and the, family, and the family on a daily basis. She persisted in remaining close. She never allowed us to be distant. She never allowed distance to separate herself from the family. And never wanted us to worry about her. Very rarely would she talk about how much pain she was in. She would catch herself talking about her problems, and she would stop and say, no boo-booing, and change the subject. My mom was tough. It would have been easy for my mom to give up long ago, but she did not. She remained a constant force in our family and never put herself before her family, her kids, or her grandkids. Back to the definition of persistence. Persistence, persistence is doing something despite difficulty or delay in achieving success. My mom persisted through a life that was not easy. She persisted for everyone in this room and for all of those who are watching online. She touched all of our lives. It was not for her, it was for us. Her success is leaving the example and a lesson that we cannot give up on anything ever. Persist. Teddy, well done. <laughs>
This is a song that's been around for more than a century. It's called Rock of Ages, Cleft for Me. Let me hide myself in me. The author of that song must have known something about rock benches because that's where we find safety and security. This tune is rather unforgettable. Once you've heard it, uh, it kind of gets stuck in your head and, and you can't help but bring those words to mind, that grand old hymn, Rock of Ages. It shows us the symbol of the Savior's love that you and I can find in the Scripture. If you don't know the song, I'm going to introduce it to you a little bit. In fact, we're going to end up with Bob singing it for us, so maybe that tune will get in your head and won't ever come out, and that will remind you of the Savior's love. You see, the first song of the Savior's love that we find in that wonderful hymn is that the Savior's love is the purpose is to reclaim our hearts. Hearts are amazing. Our hearts can be stopped on an operating table and then restarted when the doctor is finished and our life goes on. A heart can be broken by unrequited love or unchecked disease. It can be pierced by the compassion one feels when we see a starving child, but the one most important fact about the human heart is that it can be lost forever without Jesus Christ. You see, the Bible tells us that it's appointed unto man, that's all of us, once to die. And at death, the heart can be lost forever. The tragedy of death is when you step into a, a Christless eternity. <coughs> when you face the rest of your future without knowing who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for you and rejecting those truths for your own life, thinking, you know what? I'm going to be the God of my own life. Tell me what a God of their own life does when they die. It's not a God I want to put my faith and trust in. So why should I look in the mirror and put my faith in myself? I need to look for someone who is bigger and beyond who I am. We often talk about a lost soul, a lost heart, a lost life. We use that word lost because we need to be reminded of our heart's need to be reclaimed, to be found, to be, as Jesus said, born again. The late Dr. Herschel Hobbs used to tell about visiting Hiroshima, Japan in the late 50s. And in a, in a museum, he saw a large stone that had once been part of the entrance to a building. The stone was black except for the shape of a man silhouetted against the stone. This man's body had taken the full brunt of the nuclear rays, leaving his form etched in the stone. You see, this old man, this, this, this man, an unknown man, was standing in front of the rock, had he been hiding in the rock, in the cleft, he would have been protected from the Holocaust. You and I should never get in front of the rock or behind the rock. Certainly, we need to be wise enough to not get under the rock, but we do need to have enough wisdom to hide in the rock. That's what David meant when he said, in the cleft of the rock. This suggests that we all know that the only security for our hearts against the consequences of death is to be hidden in the cleft of the rock of ages. What Jesus did on the cross when he shed his blood for us was the act of making the double cure that the song tells us about available to us all. He saves us from the wrath of sin, and he also makes us pure and holy. His wound inside was broken open for us. His hands and feet were pierced for us. John 3, 16, the scripture verse of whether folks go to church or not, they know that verse. In fact, there's some crazy guy at football games that holds that verse up in the stadium almost every game that you can see on TV. For God, what? So loved the world. And he did what? Gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him would not perish but have everlasting life. The Savior's love is so great that he wants to reclaim our heart. And Paul tells us to believe in our hearts and then confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus. And what will happen? We will be saved. It's not about how many times I go to church or how many good deeds I've done. It's not whether I've balanced the scales between only going to school half a day rather than going all day. <coughs> Thief on the cross. Two of them. One on each side of Jesus. 
One of them began to curse Jesus and make fun of him and said, Hey, if you really are who you say you are, get us down from here and set us free and let's get back to business. But the other one on the other side, hey, he said, Hey, shut up. This is the Tim Roll of 21st century version. All right? <laughs> he said, Hey, brother, shut up. You and I are getting what we deserve. This one has done nothing wrong. And then he turned his attention to Jesus and he said, Would you remember me? <coughs> What did Jesus say? Oh, you need to go to church for three years before I can let you enter the kingdom? Oh, you need to make an offering of so much money before you can get in? Oh, you need to balance the scales? That man had no time to do anything except read that prayer. And Jesus said to him, today you will be with me. Not the fact that you're not going to die on this cross, but the fact is death will not have the last word in your life. You will be with me in eternity today. That's the good news of the gospel. God's love wants to reclaim our hearts. And when we sing this song, Rock of Ages, we remember the sacrifice that he made, born in the heart of God, before the foundation of the world. And in case you don't know the words, here's the first verse. Rock of Ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from your wounded side which flowed be of sin the double cure. It takes care of me now and it takes care of me forever. Save from wrath and make me pure. The second symbol of the Savior's love of this old hymn is the empty hands. Cancer is a good analogy for sin in this world. This is the word that nobody wants to talk about. Pastors don't even like to say the word sin much anymore in the pulpit. None of us like to be referred to as sinners. Can't we dress that up and make it look a little bit nicer? Uh, can you tell me of a better way to say the word cancer? There's not a more pleasant word. It's a reality. Sin is a reality and it is a fact. And there's a lot of similarities between the two. Cancer or sin both quietly take over our lives. It's very pervasive and they both are very lethal. It is one thing to detect cancer, quite another to defeat it. Sin is detectable. It's very hard to defeat on our own. But Jesus says, I've got the antidote for sin. It is my blood that I shed for you and now it is my life that will come live within you. The Bible teaches that the penalty of sin is death, and that means since we're all sinners, the penalty for our own lives is death. That's the universal state of all mankind. We are all sentenced to death row. Therefore, the chief activity that occupies our thoughts, or should, is finding a means of appeal, a way out. The Bible informs us that defeating sin is not our own ability. Isaiah 64, 6 says, But we are all as unclean thing, unrighteous, like filthy rags, and we all fade as a leaf. And our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. So what do we do? If that's our condition, what do we do? The first thing we do is stop ignoring it. Have you ever known family or friends who ignored having cancer? A gentleman who works for us flew out yesterday. No, excuse me, flew out this morning. Because his brother passed away this weekend. He went in the hospital on a Friday and he died on Sunday. And that's the first time his family knew that their brother had cancer. <coughs> Why? Because the brother knew he had cancer, didn't want to go to the doctor and be told that he had cancer. And so cancer did its worst. And sin does the same thing. We may know we're sinners, but we don't want to deal with it, and so we simply ignore it. The good news of the gospel is we don't have to do anything. Christ has done it for us on the cross. Our job is to come to him decidedly with empty hands. The song says, in my hands no Christ I bring, simply to the cross I claim. His hands, they have a nail prints. It is through those nail-pierced hands that the blood of Christ cleanses us from all of our sin. And so we sing that song to remember our empty hands. And last of all, the third symbol of the song of the Savior's love is there is a home that is waiting for us. You all were trapped in a brand new trailer. It was your home away from home. There's a little irony in that. Because that home was just temporary. Just like the one you've lived in for 28 years. She's just a traveler 
on a pilgrimage through this world. And in those temporary homes, in Clovis and on the road, they were just temporary. Anne is now in the home that's been waiting for her ever since 2008. One day, we'll get to go be in that very same home if we have found the antidote of sin and death. The words of Jesus have comforted a lot of folks at graveside gatherings. It was the last message that Jesus really shared with that intimate group of his disciples. Jesus, knowing that he was about to face in just a matter of hours betrayal, arrest, beatings, spittings, stripped naked and paraded down the streets in humiliation and ended with being nailed to the cross. Jesus, knowing all of that is what's about to happen, listen to the words that he shares with his best friends. Don't let your hearts be troubled. <laughs> Facing a week of the worst trouble in the history of mankind, Jesus says, don't let your hearts be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's lot, house are many mansions. If this wasn't true, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. For what purpose? That where I am, there you may be also. David added a nice twist to it when he said, when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me. Terry, you were with Anne right up to the last. And you went as far as you could. But guess what? She wasn't alone from that moment on. The Lord Jesus was with her every second, every moment, as he brought her to himself. The words of the song tell the story clearly. Will I still draw breath here? Or when they close in death, I'm carried to a place I've never been. I will trust in him to be my home. Jesus left his home on high so I can trust him for my future while I am down low. That last verse of the song goes, while I draw this fleeting breath, when my eyes shall close in death, when I rise to the world's high and high, behold you on your throne, rock of ages, left for me, let me hide. You see, the way to trust Jesus is to give all we know of ourselves to all we know of who he is. We might not know it all, and we don't have to. We might not have our life in order, and that's, that's when we need to come to him. Simply be willing to trust him. We have a heart, an inner life. Give that to the one whose heart was broken for us. We have hands. Give them emptied of all possessions and work to the one whose hands were pierced to be a blessing for us. Give them by coming to we have a place we call home. Let's give it up. Let's call home where he calls home. Let's be citizens of the kingdom. The cleft and the rock. It was good for the manager. It was good for us. This is available to every single one of us. Let me close. There was a young woman who was married. She had two beautiful children. But one day she was standing over the sink washing dishes, she thought. There must be more to life. <coughs> when her husband came home, he found a note that she had written, and he began to weep. She would call him once a week just to check on her children. She was doing her own thing. And he would always tell her how much that he loved her, and he would beg her to come home. And week after week, she would say no and hang up the phone. Finally, the husband hired her private investigator to see if he could find where she was living. And the private investigator found the apartment that she was living in across town. And the husband went there. Nervously, he was holding a bouquet of flowers, and he stood at the door knocking, preparing to ask his wife to come home. He had rehearsed over and over what he might say, and he finally got up the nerve, and he knocked on the door, and she opened the Door. And he started to speak, but she suddenly began to weep, and she fell into his arms, and she looked up at his eyes and said, Let's go home. Let's go home. She managed through the tears to say, Let's go home. Months later, when their relationship had healed and was growing again, he finally, finally asked her something that had bothered him for months. He said, Honey, all these times that I talked to you on the phone and I asked you to come back and you refused, why didn't you come back? 
before she started tears in her eyes, before you were just telling me that you loved me, when you came after me, you showed me that you loved me. The Bible tells us that the Lord Jesus left the glory of heaven and came to the humility of earth to show his great love for us. And here's what he asked each of us. Will you come home? Will you come home? No fancy formula. No special prayers. I'm not even going to ask you to come down to the front, though that would be perfectly acceptable. But I am going to ask you on this day that we're here to celebrate Anne Gray's life, you can let her have an impact in this world one more time. And that is in the quietness of this closing moment. You can breathe a prayer as simple as a thief on the cross. God, you don't deserve what you're getting because you are who you say you are. I deserve the full penalty of my sin. But would you remember me? And you could be that honest of a prayer. Jesus comes to you. And your heart now becomes his home, and you can now hide in the cleft of the rock that is known as Jesus Christ. And when death comes, as unexpectedly as it did for Anne Bray, it won't catch you unprepared. It may catch us by surprise, but death does not have to catch us unprepared. I'm going to ask Bob to come and sing this song that we've just talked about that has its truths written in Scripture. The rock of ages left for me. Let me hide myself in me. During this song, I'll let you pray for us.
grateful for the life of Anne Bray. We are so privileged to have had her as our friend, to have known her as our sister in Christ. Father, it brings us great joy on a day like today to know that though she is absent from us, she is ever present with you. And Father, thank you for the opportunity we've had as family and friends to gather together to honor her, to recognize her, but most of all, to celebrate the reality that she is not dead. She lives. That's a promise that we make to every one of us. Father, thank you for listening to the hearts that are in this sanctuary today. Maybe as a result of the influence of Anne's life and this gathering that we've had, have called out and said, Rock of Ages, enough for me. I want to hide myself in you. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayers. And you honor those prayers by coming quickly. You forgive us of our sin. You make heaven our eternal home. And you come to make our heart your home. Thank you. 